Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Outside the Box video. Well, I teased this the other day in terms of the making of this video through a new poll asking everyone out there if you would like for me to talk about a location that's very popular, very known within the Alien franchise or talk about a character that was kind of lost in the wind when it, came to, when it came to the Terminator franchise. And so based on all the results and well over 50 of you voted, uh, I decided to go ahead and do this one based on the winner and it has to do with this it's a location that I've talked about just briefly in the past very recently too in fact with my other outside the box video the one focusing on Jonathan Clemens the character from Alien 3 now I'm going to talk about the actual location that the movie took place in in this case known as Fiorina 161 so the very first time I'm talking about an actual place with regards to the series rather than a character or set of characters. So I'm pretty excited to share this information here and then I'll explain why I, I so wanted to talk about this particular uh, location too. So let's go ahead and let's talk about all the info, the rich info associated with the location known as Fiorina 161. So what was this location that's there in the hallmark of the Alien franchise? Well, it goes by several names. There's the more common one, the Fiorina 161, but it's also known as the nickname as Fury. 161 or others just outright call it just Fury and there's a reason for that and it's because of the fact that it's a very very harsh planet to live on not just with regards to the characters there but just all around the entire planet is one single ball of Fury if you will when it comes to its harsh harsh conditions there so this was the planet that was featured in Alien 3 and has been mentioned throughout other parts of the Alien franchise. More on that here in a minute. But first, let's talk about the characteristics associated with this planet. This is why I wanted to talk about it, because I love all the things, all the tri all the trivia, all the uh, aspects, all the characteristics tied to this location. I don't know why, but I love when anything involves like a barren wasteland, like something where you can just look at it and it goes on for eons and you can just see like almost the decay. You can see the horrid conditions. It looks like it's just about to go under, but it's still, it's fascinating to me. I don't know why, but it's almost like if I were to visit any other place out there here on earth involving urban decay like those photos that you see of abandoned malls that have all this um uh, stuff like uh, deteriorating on the inside or if you go to those abandoned amusement parks that have all that foliage creepily you know uh, encompassing all those rides that's the kind of stuff that I love I don't know why but it simply it definitely uh, falls into my favor such was the case of this particular planet there in Alien 3 this was a planet that was by far one of the worst condition planets you could live on and it has to do with this for starters it's a binary star system meaning there's two stars that come out on a daily basis two suns if you will that help create its warmth but it makes it very very hot at the same time uh, two stars that's very popular of course in Star Wars a uh, very popular feature so I'm wondering if that was a little nod to uh, when the filmmakers were making this film to that other film but yes that two that two star system allows the temperatures to get very very high up to 104 degrees in fact on a daily basis so it can get pretty hot and then on top of that at nighttime it plummets to below in this case zero degrees and get to negative four degrees there so very very extreme temperatures clearly something in this case that you would have to have uh, a shelter to live in throughout all standpoints so and then uh, otherwise this this thing was uh, this planet had a large amount of oceans on top of the barren wasteland these oceans though they were not something that you could just you know frolic around and then swim in now in this case these oceans were oily they were considered acidic as well like it was something where it's probably not you know gonna boil you alive but at the same time you don't want to stay far in it too long it created acidic rain too and then on top of that the winds were so strong because there was no mountains because there was no plateaus nothing to help stop the wind from just blowing as hard as possible it would create a stinging sensation not just the wind itself but when it rained as well so here you have in this case extreme cold extreme hot and then you have also acidic uh, nature when it comes to the rain and then on top of that everything is always stinging 
very, very bad planet to live on. On top of that, only the toughest types of creatures could do so. So in the oceans, the novel describes that there you could find some kind of, of uh, I guess, um, mammals. I don't know if they really are mammals or if there's some kind of large oceanic life forms. But whatever these were, these were considered to be larger than usual. Unfortunately, the novel didn't go into too much description into what they were. But considering, again, like the type of oceans that they had to live in, no doubt they were large and they were tough. And on the ground itself, there were smaller animals that were considered non-intelligent. Like these were clearly just going to be just wild animals that never really would evolve to anything else. And then by far the, the most prominent life form on the entire planet are the insects, the bugs. The film fe uh, heavily talked about it, but didn't really show it too many sequences is far more on the deleted scenes on the special edition but there the insects definitely ruled the world they were the only ones that could multiply and multiply in huge numbers because they could satisfy all the conditions of this tough planet and those insects were brutal according to the novel according to the comics and in the film itself they would eat anything that they would come into contact with anything that could be considered a life form if you happen to be out there let's say in the the barren wasteland and you happen to fall asleep you better be covered because by the time you wake up it's too late like these things would have probably eaten you halfway through that's how brutal these things were and then on top of that they also uh, fa uh, had a favorite thing when it came to humans uh, when it came to their uh, hairs as well so that's why the film featured a lot of the inmates there uh, just heavily shaved so that way they didn't have to have uh, these insects bothering them outright. But yes, by far they were the rulers of that planet. But that in essence is the atmosphere itself, hence the name Fury. Tough creatures, tough conditions, definitely a place you don't want to be uh, on the long term. So what did this planet do? Well, it served a major role in the company of Wayland yutani because of the fact that it was uh, for all intents and purposes, an abandoned planet. So it was there rich in resources, especially when it came to doing lead works or some kind of refinery for the lead works. Now, the novel and the film didn't go into too many details, like what kind of resources these were from, but presumably they would have been either underground or somewhere where those giant cranes could essentially gather those resources and gather them in multitudes. And in fact, it seems like once Mylan Yutani found out about these resources, they created like these gigantic places, like in this case, the correctional facility that's seen within the film. And that place is huge, absolutely huge. The movie didn't do any justice because the novel goes on to explain that it's about 14 kilometers long. Imagine that one giant building stretched out 14 kilometers long. You would have to travel 60 miles an hour and then drive around 15 miles, I'm sorry, about 10 to 15 minutes, and you would reach from one point to one point finally. So this thing was gigantic. It housed thousands of custodians, more importantly, thousands of prisoners, and it contained hundreds and hundreds of miles of just these pipes. All these pipes just interconnecting one another, both on top and on the bottom, because according to the novel, there was even more underground than there was on top, which makes sense because of the tough conditions that this uh, that this planet had. Most of the inmates, most of the Cassonians, most of the activity actually was built underground. So yes, once Wayland Utani found out about these resources, they decided to keep this planet a secret. And when they did so, they brought over uh, uh, all these people and then they did the correctional facility, they did their lead works refinery, and they were able to mine or do something, like refine all these resources and do it within a short time period. In fact, it was only like a small number of years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, based on the novel that, that, that all the resources were then exhausted. Imagine that uh, the entire planet's resources, all the entire planet's, all of it gone just within a few number of years. Can you imagine the activity that would have taken like those those uh, those giant cranes that are featured in the film? They must have been uh, going on an exhausting pace day in, day out, like just completely hundreds of ships probably flying in and flying out, carrying all these resources up to the top of space and then taking the uh, like those jars, those large ships then taking all that stuff, all that material back to the Wayland Yutani headquarters. So that's essentially what it served. It served as a honeypot for all this uh, rich assets that, that they could just mine on their own. Afterward, once everything was exhausted, then most of the correctional facility was shut down. That's when it became a much smaller 
tinier, I mean, we're talking like a fraction of the size of, of what was used from before, all of that then contained uh, and continued as a much smaller facility. In fact, by the time of Alien 3, in terms of what did it do, like this, this, this location and what it served as, by that point, it was just a prison, but for about maybe 25 people. Imagine that it went from thousands and thousands of people to, in this case, just 25. The rest of it was just completely abandoned, like everything else, all those other locations, uh, like the 14 kilometers or so, most of it was just left as is, just abandoned and then shut down. And every now and then, the novel said that the prisoners would make sure that certain portions of it were kept maintained just sporadically to make absolutely certain that, yes, that stuff, if needed in the future, could still be functioning. Like, they, it won't necessarily be um, in a decrepit state thereafter. But for all intents and purposes, just a very tiny portion of that correctional facility was used 24 hours a day afterward. So why did Wayne and Tony do all this? Like, what, what, plan, what, what purpose did it serve? Why did the, the, the company decide to use this? Well, again, it all ties into the nature of, in this case, the company itself. Remember how when the, there's that famous line in Alien, how it's all part of being an expendable crew, such was the case here with this planet, this location. This was an expendable planet. It was a planet that was kept in secret, like I mentioned earlier, no doubt, to make sure that um, there's no other groups there on Earth or anywhere else to protest with regards to the huge depletion of this location. Who knows how uh, William Tony found out about this. They, they, it's a big company, so they probably had a bunch of scouts that would go about throughout the galaxy trying to find planets for new resources. And every time they did so, then they, that they would hide that stuff from everyone else, not just from these, re from these companies, I'm sorry, from these uh, groups, but also probably from other companies, competitors, that would try to make sure that they would not get those assets first. But that's why they did it. It was an expendable planet. There was no sentient life forms there. Uh, probably the most advanced animal would have been those non-intelligent smaller mammals that were found huddled throughout various parts of the land, and that's it. So they could exploit it to their content and not have anybody else say otherwise. Not that the company would have cared anyways, because history shows within the Alien franchise, even if there was, like let's say, a small group of humans, whatever, that just happened to be at that planet before ahead of time, the company would have made sure that they would have taken care of those people and then everything else would have been silenced afterwards so but that's essentially why the planet was there like what it, what it, what what purpose was it it was essentially a gigantic place to exploit and uh, being an expendable planet so what happened to it essentially within the film well as you saw once everything happened there the alien was born you saw the calamity that it caused you saw in this case Ripley sacrificing herself and then it was uh, too little, too late for uh, Waylon Yutani to try to uh, rescue, in this case, that, that queen that they were trying to harbor. The planet was then shut down. That's, that's pretty much it. Like, it was shut down as is. There was only one survivor afterward, in that case being Morse, who, who went on to, um, according to the Alien universe, he, uh, in other words, a franchise universe, he went on to write a novel with regards to his experiences there. And uh, that way he was able, he was trying to share what happened in his own words. Um, uh, surprising that the company even allowed him to live in the first place, considering how much they were there to protect uh, the, anybody that knew knowledge of the dragon, or in this case, the alien, to prevent it from being uh, within too many others. In other words, to prevent the largest number of eyes from seeing it. So surprising that they let him live but he tried to create that novel, but at least they were able to stop it. So, And as far as the location, supposedly everything else was sold as scrap. So those giant cranes featured within the background, they were going to be sold as scrap. Same with the correctional facility itself. All those hundreds of miles of pipes and steel, all of that would just be sold piece by piece to somebody else um, somewhere out there, another competitor, another company, who knows. But eventually the company decided, William Tani decided that it wasn't worth kept uh, keeping open after the, uh, the the chaos that ensued from Alien 3. So that's essentially what happened to it. But what would have occurred if the story continued? Like, let's say further on down the road, 
what would have happened um, with this planet and its location there. Surprisingly enough, it was actually touched upon this thought, and this is my favorite time, you know, whenever I think, whenever I try to hypothesize, like, what happens to somebody, or in this case, a location afterward, the story continued, and it was in various formats, like, for example, throughout various games and various novels, and as far as the games, there was even a predator that was able to revisit this planet. I guess there was another alien infestation that occurred there, and so in one of those Alien vs. Predator games, uh, the predator uh, visited this planet in one of those levels, and was able to, to 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 see essentially what happened there. And then also throughout uh, another game, there was the Aliens Colonial Marines. It was revisited through the form of a multiplayer format. I think this was the one that I've seen it on YouTube, the, the people play it there, that it is the closest to being the most movie accurate. You can actually visit within that multi-level, uh, multiplayer level, you can visit several locations prominent within the actual movie itself so that's probably the closest one and then throughout novels it's been revisited too uh, it's been mentioned and then it's have featured like as a cameo in fact there was one novel uh, that had in this case another set of marines if i'm not mistaken or they were some other part of of the company itself that uh, apparently there was yet another alien infestation happening there and so they were set to revisit that location and then before uh the the, the um the thing that happens, like in this case, before they land down, right when they get to it, that's when the short story finishes. So all those places, it revisited, uh, all those formats revisited these locations, this one, this specific one, and it was all about the fact that, yes, this thing was still there. That ties into my theory, too. Um, all these resources were apparently sold as scrap. But can you imagine how much that would cost, the effort of this? Because this is a planet that is light years out there. It's about 19.5 light years or so away from Earth. So anybody that wanted all these resources, they would have to go through all that expense of going all the way here, going down into this very inhospitable planet, and then getting all this stuff fighting, in this case, uh, the stinging rain, the extreme temperatures, all these insects, just to get this stuff from, in this case, the sled, the metal, everything there, from point A to point B, and then try to do it at a profit. I don't think that really happened. I think in some cases, like, this was probably sold as scrap, and then it was just abandoned thereafter. Like, whoever bought it probably saw later on, you know, this is going to take far too much effort, and then once that happened, they decided that, no, they're just going to leave it there. So that leads to my other theory. If the alien universe truly existed, like, if you could walk into it, like, if you could open up your TV and walk into it, and you could go 100 years from now, or from the time point of, in that case, the uh, Alien 3 timeline, you could go there and probably visit the exact exact locations as is like it was left as is a state of living history if you will and you could spot the exact places that that happened there in alien 3 like murphy the prisoner that was i think he was the first victim from the alien the one when the alien was still growing and it spit at him from its pocket there um, in one of the, uh, uh, the, the lead pipes. Uh, you could probably go visit that location and see the fan where he essentially got eviscerated. Uh, or you could go see the assembly hall, the famous one there, where all the prisoners would gather. They would have their assembly. They would have very important meetings and then wander around that location. You probably you could even go to that same place where um, the candles were being lit by those prisoners as they were exploring those other parts there. And you could probably still see those candles there to this day, uh, still like there as is and probably take one as a souvenir. So, so in other words, you could visit it and it would be the same exact condition as it was before. So somewhere in the alien universe to this day, no matter where the timeline is in uh, the alien franchise, there's that congressional facility, there's that planet just still there, 100% the same as is, which is quite fascinating to me because it would be something like you could just go visit, all ties in, like I was mentioning earlier, with the state of urban decay. You could go visit and then you'd be able to see it almost like it was frozen in time and you see the planet slowly deteriorating it. Eventually, at some point, of course, like hundreds of years into the future, 
uh, the the Crescian facility would have been taken over by the planet's harsh conditions. So whatever happened at that point, who knows? But something would have been done. So, but that's it. That's pretty much all the info associated with this location, uh, Fiorina One Six One Fury. Another case is also known as Fury One Six One. What do you guys think? Is this a con uh, place that? that you think about as well every now and then from the Alien franchise? Is it something that you would love to have seen revisited sometime soon? I would. I mean, it would be great to see this place in an official film format sometime soon. Uh, who knows? There's even the idea that Alien uh, might have a series, a TV series, happening sometime in the future. And if that's the case, then the Alien franchise goes that route. Maybe they'll revisit this one soon, and that would be amazing. I would certainly love to see that, too. The last bit of trivia with this location, too, with this Fury 160. One originally it was supposed to be a wooden planet. There's all this famous lore associated with how many times Alien 3 went through revisions. Like there was so many script changes, so many different th uh, points that of interest, like where this film was going to go. But yes, at one point it was going to be a wooden planet floating out there in space, and when that happened, it was going to be filled with monks. But then eventually that kind of turned into being prisoners and then eventually it, be, it went from being a wooden floating planet to now being the planet that we saw on the film itself so as far as that stuff just wanted to share that trivia there's far more details of that too if you buy the special edition uh you'll get to see like all the if rich information associated with that but that's just a brief brief uh, precursor on that too so all right everybody thanks again as always take care bye